Hello and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. I'm Aaron Porras here with ILTV's Morning Briefing. An IDF soldier was injured early this morning during an operation in the Balata refugee camp near Shechem or Nablus when an explosive device was thrown at a group of soldiers. The soldier was treated by his fellow soldiers on the scene and was later taken to a nearby hospital for further treatment. The Balata refugee camp is a flashpoint location where IDF troops and residents often clash. In addition, three Palestinians armed with a pipe bomb, two Molotov cocktails, and a knife were arrested near Joseph's tomb in Shechem. Over a thousand Jewish worshippers had gathered to pray ahead of the new Hebrew month of Adar, which is on Sunday. Meanwhile, IDF Shin Beit and Israel border police forces arrested 13 Palestinians overnight suspected of being involved in terrorist activities and violent riots in the West Bank. In response to the latest wave of bomb threats leveled against Jewish community centers and institutions around the country, over 150 congressmen and women signed a letter calling for a sense of urgency in investigating the matter. The letter demands that the United States Department of Homeland Security, the Attorney General, and the FBI look into the matter immediately and in cooperation with JCC associations and local forces to put an end to the growing trend. Since the start of 2017, 69 bomb threats have been levied against 54 different North American JCCs. 11 of these threats were just earlier this week on Monday. Earlier this morning, the Anti-Defamation League headquarters in New York was targeted. As in the cases with the JCCs, the threat was a hoax, and rather than intimidating, the newest bomb threat has only galvanized their cause. ADL CEO Jonathan Greenblatt said, quote, this is not the first time that the ADL has been targeted, and it will not deter us in our efforts to combat anti-Semitism and hate against people of all races and religions. Senator Lindsey Graham will reintroduce legislation next week that would cut United States funding to the Palestinian Authority if it continues to provide monetary support to the families of those who commit acts of terror against Israelis. Known as the Taylor Force Act after the American who was knifed to death in March 2016 by a Palestinian assailant while visiting Tel Aviv, the bill was first introduced by Graham last year when Graham said, quote, Why is the Palestinian Authority paying young Palestinians to commit acts of terror against innocent Americans like Taylor Force or Israelis? The Palestinians need to decide. Do they condemn these horrible acts or do they reward them? End quote. Force, who was 29 years old at the time, had served in Iraq and Afghanistan, was a graduate student at Vanderbilt University, and was traveling with other students on a program studying global entrepreneurship. The Warsaw Poland municipality has issued a deadline to submit claims over property stolen by Nazis or communists during World War II. After the deadline passes, all property will be transferred to the state of Poland or to Warsaw. The city put out a first list on Wednesday of 50 assets belonging to Jews which was stolen from their owners either by Nazi or Communist forces during the Second World War. The municipality is asking the rightful owners to submit their claims sometime within the next six months, while Jewish organizations have been pressuring it to extend the deadline. The new law applies only in Warsaw and not the rest of Poland. Gideon Taylor of the World Jewish Restitution Organization urged authorities to notify potential claimants and to extend the very short deadline. He said, quote, It's unfair for claimants to lose this last opportunity to reconnect with their past because of the administrative complexity of this law. Among the proudest achievements in Israeli defense history is the creation of the Iron Dome missile defense system, and it's just reportedly been given an upgrade. According to the Defense Ministry, though the specific upgrades weren't disclosed, Iron Dome was put to a series of tests yesterday and passed. The system targets incoming projectiles, calculates their trajectory, and assesses the danger. It then intelligently shoots down the threats. Since its installation in 2011, Iron Dome has had a near-perfect record, taking out over 90% of its intended targets. During the 2014 war with Gaza, Hamas launched over 4,500 rockets into Israel. Iron Dome chose to destroy 799, missing 64. To supplement the Iron Dome's limitations, a three-tier system was developed, including David Sling and the Arrow 3, intended to counter medium to long range and intercontinental ballistic missiles, respectively. Last week, the president doubled down on his promise to rebuild America's infrastructure at a rally in Melbourne, Florida. We need members of both parties to join hands and work with us to pass a $1 trillion infrastructure plan 
to build new roads and bridges and airports and tunnels and highways and railways all across our great nation. For more on this, we're joined tonight by former commissioner of the United States Commodity Futures Trading Commission, Bart Chilton. Bart, good to have you with us tonight. Good to be with you. The, the audio sounds good. Is there a song that, that goes with this alleged tap dance about how these finances are going to work out? You can't have it both ways. No, and it's, 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 it's really, I mean, if there's a honeymoon period in any sort of marriage, Ed, I'm not sure that the Republicans and the White House are sleeping in the same bed right now because Mitch McConnell has said no increases for infrastructure spending. And by the way, his wife is... Uh, Mr. Trump's Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Chao. So that's a weird bedfellow too. How's that for talk? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, we need a trillion dollars, uh, hubby, and uh, that might not work out. So it's going to be a really tough road to hoe to get a trillion dollars. Well, do you think the president will get any kind of commitment? Because, as you've pointed out in the past, the Republicans are in a unique political position right now. Their leadership is experienced from the standpoint of finance. They ought to be able to have it, ought to be able to figure this out. Right. Well, Orrin Hatch, as you know, the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, he is a, a guy that works with bipartisan in a bipartisan fashion. And Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, used to be chair of the Tax Writing Committee in the House, the Ways and Means Committee. So there is a potential getting together on these things. The Democrats have put forward their own one trillion dollar infrastructure bill. Now this would be a good thing. I mean, don't no kidding aside, fifteen million jobs, and we could use those. And our roads are crumbling. Well, I think the folks that are living south of that dam in California would like a little bit better structure. And the civil engineers who we have had on this program tell us that there are hundreds of dams across the country and major structures that, that need to be reinforced and redone in many respects. It takes money, but does Washington have the political will? Well, it remains to be seen, but I think there's only a limited time here. I mean, there are so many other distractions, as you report every every night, Ed, whether or not it's the uh, the immigration ban or whether or not it's uh, LGBT rights in restrooms that they're talking about today or the excessive travel, uh, the president spending more in a month than, the, than Obama spend in a whole year. There are all sorts of distractions out there. I just wish that this is the thing where it can get Republicans and Democrats together. It's the most important thing for the economy. And I just hope he puts it forward quickly, not after 100 days, before. He's putting a lot of things forward. It's like a different major subject every day. Are the Republicans just going to get burned out on this, or do you think they'll actually get something done? Uh, I, I think it's a real wait and see. I, I, I think that if, if I were the Republicans, what I'd do is try to pull the president out of the fire from all these fiascos that are mm -hmm. going on. I would say we can do this ourselves, and Ryan and Hatch can get together with others. John Thune is the chair of the Commerce and Transportation Committee. You know him well mm -hmm. uh, from South Dakota. Those guys actually could help the administration by starting to push something. They could get Democrats together on this thing. And CBS News congressional correspondent Nancy Cordes is with us now from Milton, Florida for another town hall today. So, Nancy, is this just venting or do people really believe that they're having a real impact on lawmakers for when they return to Capitol Hill? I think it's both, Vlad. I've talked to a lot of progressive voters, a lot of Democrats who say uh, that they were just motivated by concerns about this president to come to town halls when they've never attended town halls in the past, uh, just to get it out there. And you can tell when these town halls actually start um, that they're just desperate to get it out, out of them. And uh, that does lead to some of the scenes that you've uh, observed where everyone's talking over each other and uh, you really can't make much sense of what anybody is saying. But uh, they, they say they are angry about a number of things when it comes to Donald Trump. They feel that Republican lawmakers should be pushing harder uh, for him to release his tax returns. They don't like some of the things that he has said about minority groups. They don't like the directions that his policies are going in, and they want Republican lawmakers to stand up to him. Interestingly, uh, as you saw in that piece, uh, there are a number of areas where Republican lawmakers simply aren't willing to take the hit for Donald Trump. And they say, well, that's a great question. I, I agree with you. I am going to stand up to him if he uh, says that, that the press is the enemy, for example, of the American people. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to take a bullet for him on some issues, but on 
others, they are standing by him and they say, I may not agree with everything that he says, but I agree with a lot of his policies and I am going to work with him to enact those policies, even if some of the people who are currently attending these town halls disagree with them. You know, Nancy, we've covered a few of these town halls now and it, it, it occurred to me that not only do the lawmakers have to answer questions about policy and, and the Trump administration, but here you have a president who is frequently tweeting out his feelings. And, uh, and he tweeted out how he felt about what he called the so-called angry crowds, that they were planned activists. And I wonder if some of those angry people in the crowds have now begun to ask their lawmakers about those tweets. Oh, absolutely. The tweets are a big feature uh, of these town halls. I heard you use the word epidemic the other day. You're not shy to throw around that word. Are you, is, it, is it truly at that level in central Florida, of all places? It is at that level across the United States. There's not a day goes by that we all don't arrest a lot of illegal aliens that are out here preying on the people in this country. And they're committing felonies, violent felonies, and they're trafficking in narcotics. Okay. And that, if that's so, not enough... Yeah, keep going. If, if that's not enough, we deport them, they come back and pick up doing the same thing again. Sheriff, what is your solution in this? My solution is simply this. If you went home this afternoon and there was water flowing in your house, would you start mopping it up, or would you first turn off the source of the leak? We have to turn off the source of the leak we have to get these illegal criminals, these illegal aliens, out of this country and keep them out. I understand. They are I understand preying your on our people. You have to do it right. You would agree with that, correct? Absolutely. Okay, then what is the correct way, sir? The correct way is simply this. We already have the laws in place. All we have to do is have the will of the federal government, and for the first time in many, many, many years, we have that will. We're seeing a total different attitude by immigration and customs already. And what we have to do is pick them up, keep them locked up until they're deported to their home country of origin. And I can tell you this, the community will be safer, less drugs will flow on our streets, and there will be less weapons violence. Every day my detectives go out and they seek out and arrest people for violating the drug laws. Many of those folks are illegal aliens here with guns, posing a, a specific danger to our deputies, to our law enforcement officers, and to the communities. But I have a simple question for those who think there's a problem with that. Why don't you take them home with you? Why don't you rent them a home next door to you? Because you know they're living next door to somebody in our community and they're terrorizing them. Well, I know you're focused they're on law and order, you know, and I just they gotta go. just interject this here. Others are focused on the economy. Do you think we take a hit economically if you get what you're talking about today? Oh, I absolutely do not think we take an economic hit because I come from a community that's both suburban and rural. A lot of farmers, the people we arrest, they're not harvesting any vegetables or any citrus. They urge the government to abandon its planned deportation of asylum seekers. They particularly voice concern over the fate of Afghan refugees who are the second largest group of asylum seekers after the Syrians. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has landed in Mexico for a meeting with President Enrique Peña Nieto. The two sides are to discuss trade, ways to curb illegal immigration and drug trafficking. Mexico's foreign minister had earlier said that he would not accept new U.S. immigration policy proposals, that is. And Amnesty International has released an annual report on human rights. Amnesty's Africa team has reported horrible rights practices in the volatile continent. Amnesty has called on many governments across the world, including that of Nigeria, to address concerns emanating from rights violations in those countries.